presented by Dr. Ryan Westergaard. Our webinar is titled Coordination of Prevention Services for People Who Inject Drugs, Lessons from the Wisconsin Rural Opioid Initiative. And uh, your webinar today is brought to you by the Great Lakes Addiction Technology Transfer Center. We're one of 10 U.S.-based and six international HIV ATTC centers. The ATTC network is celebrating 25 years of support from our funder, SAMHSA, this year. And as I mentioned earlier, we cover the six states in the Upper Great Lakes region, that's Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. This webinar, like all of our Great Lakes ATTC webinars, will be recorded. The recording and the slides will be available on our website within the next week to 10 days. And there you see on the slide our website address, attcnetwork.org forward slash Great Lakes. And we do not offer CEUs for this webinar. As I mentioned earlier, again, uh, the webinar is being recorded through your computer. So make sure your speakers are turned on and up. There's no phone number that you need to use for this webinar. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please use the chat feature to ask your questions. And we'll save some time after Dr. Westergaard's presentation for a Q&A. And our presenter today is Dr. Ryan Westergaard. I'll tell you a little bit about his background. Dr. Westergaard attended medical school at Johns Hopkins. He completed primary care internal medicine residency at the University of Colorado, Denver. And he received a fellowship training in infectious diseases at Johns Hopkins Hospital and the Johns Hopkins AIDS Service, along with cl clinical research training at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Since 2011, he's been a care provider for HIV AIDS Comprehensive Care Program at the UW Hospital and Clinic. He provides HIV-oriented primary care to patients in Madison and other areas of Wisconsin, including people incarcerated in the Wisconsin Department of Corrections. Today, Dr. Westergaard will be telling us more about a recent initiative that was focusing on rural areas of Wisconsin and now, uh, Dr. Westergaard, would you like to take it away? Thank you very much, Maureen. And thank you to everyone for joining the webinar. On the attendee list in the lower right-hand corner, I see a, a number of familiar names. So greetings to everyone that we've, I've met before, or and, uh, including a number of people that I work with closely on the project that I'm going to be discussing. So thank you for joining us. The title of the talk is Coordination of Prevention Services for People Who Inject Drugs, Lessons from the Wisconsin Rural Opioid Initiative. The alternative title, or perhaps a subtitle, is What Can the Global Response to HIV AIDS Teach Us About the Opioid and Hepatitis C Crisis? When <clears throat> my teammates and I have presented this work to more clinical audiences, we've really drawn this connection. And so I'm going to be presenting a number of um, background slides and, and talk about themes that have evolved in the three decades old response to HIV and thinking about the ways that it can help us address the current crisis of opioid overdose and hepatitis C. The learning objectives are here. Um, specifically, we're going to talk about how comprehensive patient-centered care has transformed the HIV epidemic in the U.S. and then describe um, a multi-site NIH-funded initiative, which is known as the Rural Opioid Initiative, um, which is a proposal to build client-centered prevention homes really inspired by the response to HIV within service, syringe service programs in four Wisconsin counties. So this slide shows the juxtaposition of the, the two epidemics of, of our lifetime. On the left is the number of AIDS deaths in the United States between 1981 and 2007. And I put this next to the current um, more uh, more uh, contemporary death uh, epidemic of overdose deaths involving opioids um, to highlight how 20 or 30 years ago, 
the number one le the leading cause of death among people aged 25 to 44 was AIDS. And it, there was a sharp inflection point in 1995 of course, coincided with the development of antiretroviral therapies. <clears throat> On the right, you'll see that the opioid overdose epidemic has uh, easily surpassed the AIDS epidemic as the leading cause of death among young people. But we've not yet reached any inflection point. And the question is, what can we learn from how we've addressed HIV to, see, to find a strategy for turning the corner? This shows the magnitude of the two epidemics. The, the, peak year, the year in which AIDS deaths reached a peak was in 1995 at, 50, at about 50,000. In 2017, the number of people who died from drug overdoses was, was uh, nearly 50% higher, and to date does not show any signs of slowing down. There's also a direct connection between these two epidemics. Um, in Wisconsin, and it's similar to many states around the country, public health had a very robust response and was able to, to control the number of HIV cases attributable to injection drug use at very low levels. But the current epidemic of opioid and increasingly methamphetamine abuse has really threatening to undo this. The figure on the left here shows that since 2015 to 2017, there was a, a, a tripling of HIV cases in Wisconsin caused by injection drug use. You'll see at the axis, it's still a relatively small number. It went from 5 to 15, um, but nevertheless a tripling. Hepatitis C, on the other hand, has exploded as a result of the current epidemic of injection drug use, um, and it is uh, magnitude, orders of magnitude higher. In Wisconsin, we're seeing up to 1,000 new cases a year. And although it looks like there's a little dip between 2015 and 2016, this is actually an artifact related to reporting. They're actually, um, the number from 2015 to 2016 and 2017 does not show any signs of slowing down um, among transmission of hepatitis C among young people. So, and the risk to communities across the country is really exemplified in what was the most dramatic and the most explosive HIV outbreak really in the continent in the past 20 years, which happened in small rural communities in southern Indiana and Scott County. In 2015, there was a, a, a cluster of 11 new HIV infections in a county that had had only five infections in the previous decade. And when all was said and done, there were 231 cases. So I, I bring this up again in, in the previous uh, webinar that we submit, that we presented on, on hepatitis C and HIV a few months ago. We talked about the same as a case study. But I want to focus on the response. And the two figures on this slide, the bottom, were taken from the New England Journal article that really showed the outbreak investigation and the response. And it's helpful to look here at the, um, the tail ends of, of this. I thought I had a pointer here. I can do. Um, here we go. So um, it, within six months, really, the majority of the number of cases were de tested because of a program of implementing rapid testing and linkage to care. And by the time um, uh, the year, the two, the two year of the study had gone by, they had really saturated the number of cases, and most everyone had been tested and linked to care. On the left, it shows the, the, the same data, the cumulative cases, and how, and all the things that happened in order to c control this response, including establishing an incident command center, getting federal support in terms of surveillance and, and resources and funding, declaring a public health emergency, starting syringe exchange programs. Um, and we can really see the leveling off of this um, really showed that what we've learned from HIV um, can be used and scaled up in a relatively rapid sense to control these outbreaks of communicable diseases resulting from infectious diseases. So that's the good news. We know how to do this. And um, the, H the HIV response was encapsulated here on this community level from, um, by uh, in investigators and leaders in Indiana showing how it really took a multifaceted, multi-stakeholder uh, uh, partnership, including federal funders and local partners and state partners and academic partners, all around the goal of getting people identified, getting people t uh, linked to treatment, and getting the virus suppressed. And that has really been the key of stopping HIV transmission in communities, is getting people on treatment and getting the virus suppressed to undetectable levels. The bad news, of course, is that we 
didn't know how to stop this from happening in the first place. And it raises the question of, are there communities where this is vulnerable? And what lessons have we learned that can, that can help us mobilize the resources to prevent outbreaks from HIV, rather than having to respond with all of the, the techno technological tools that we have? So that's really been a focus on by CDC and other federal partners for the past several years, is trying to understand what communities at risk and what can we do. This, used national, this is a, a study that used national data from a number of sources to try to identify local, likely hotspots based on the number of cases of acute hepatitis C, which is a marker for trans, you know, blood borne tra, uh, infections being transmitted by injection drug use. And it showed the areas of the country where this seems to be likely. To try to get a better understanding of the things that are, at the tools that are that are at our disposal to prevent this, the National Institute of Health, specifically the National Fund Drug Abuse, partnered with the the CDC and SAMHSA, who's the funder of the the ATCTC, which is funding this webinar, um, to fund a number of large community engaged research projects, and that's what we'll be talking about the rest of the rest of our our talk today. The goal of the Rural Opioid Initiative, convened by these federal partners, was to identify best practices that can be disseminated to address the particular need of communities in confronting the opioid epidemic, to conduct community assessments, and then using these assessments to design plans for implementing evidence-based practices to address the crisis of opioid overdose, the risk of HIV AIDS transmission, hepatitis C, and other related comorbidities. And then finally, to evaluate the implementation of these plans to develop a, a toolkit of best practices that communities can use. So the map on the left shows that shows the areas that the federal partners selected to, to implement this work. And Wisconsin and, uh, Wisconsin and southern Illinois, um, actually southern Ohio as well, are there are representatives in this collaborative in the Great Lakes region. I'm specifically going to be talking about the project in Wisconsin, which is in close partnership with a community-based organization called the AIDS Resource Center of Wisconsin. The Wisconsin map on the right highlights the cities or the counties where the study is being taken place. They include Douglas County, Eau Claire County, Marathon County, La Crosse County, Outagamie, and Brown County. So why is ARCW such an important partner in this work? Well, if this figure looks somewhat familiar with the various stakeholders, the various components connected by lines and various circles. It, it, was, it was on purpose. What I wanted to draw the connection between was the response to HIV in the Indiana outbreak and what is the model that's been developed at ARCW, which is called the HIV medical home. And it's built on the model that people who are living with HIV, as well as people who are at risk for HIV, have a broad and uh, and heterogeneous set of needs, both medical needs and social services needs, that are best met with a coordinated approach. So ARCW, which in addition to providing HIV care in Milwaukee and, and Madison, has expanded to um, Denver and St. Louis in the past few years, is really implementing this model showing that um, if we pay attention to social determinants of health and the social service and needs of our clients, we can make sure that a high number of people get, have optimal outcomes related to HIV care. And this is really based on the patient-centered medical home model, which is something that is um, pr um, also celebrated and promoted by federal funders, at the AHRQ, um, and has been really adopted as the best model, um, more along the lines of complex health systems serving people with complicated health needs. The idea is that patient is the center of the of the health network, and we build systems around to make sure that the patient receives care that's coordinated across these, and not, not, not that the patient is, is left alone to try to navigate these complex and disparate sets of care. Um, the key concepts of patient-centered care in this model is that it is comprehensive, it's patient-centered, coordinated, accessible, and it has attention paid to high quality and safety. So we in the HIV field have been doing this for a long time even though ARCW is rel a relative trailblazer in, in, in calling it a patient-centered HIV medical home. The Ryan White Care Program, which has funded HIV care around the country, traditionally for people with, with, who are uninsured or are underinsured, has really adopted the, the, the model that um, the social service needs and complex needs must be met, and has dedicated a great, a great deal of funding to make sure that no, no one gets left behind who is living with HIV because we know that, that optimal medical treatment is the best way to keep 
keep people uh, alive and healthy, as well as reducing the transmission of HIV. So this is a large, you know, one of the largest federal funding programs that there is. Um, the total funding of HIV spending in 2018 was over $26 billion, which is uh, still quite a bit further ahead than number the, any proposal for the amount of funds has been set aside for opioid response. And the outcomes back this up that this is a very useful model. So Ryan White clinics that refi receive Ryan White funding have um, even those that, that tailor, and especially those that tailor to high need populations who are traditionally underserved, have just as good, if not better, clinical outcomes, or here we're talking about virologic outcomes and the level of viral suppression than patients with commercial insurance and general practice. And the reason is because they receive these surfaces here that are shown on the left, medical case management, co-located substance abuse treatment, mental health services, social services, dental services, adherence counseling. All these things are, are standard of care in, in the Ryan White Care, Ryan White care Act fund package um, of, of services, and that's what's really translated to do this to, to um, ensure that the uh, HIV epidemic has been so well controlled. So now we move to prevention services. And the, the biggest reason, to answer my earlier question, of why ARCW, and this, this particular organization, is such an important partner in this work, is that alongside development of the HIV medical home, is that they've invested um, resources in developing prevention services. And this is exemplified by the LifePoint needle exchange. This is built on the harm reduction model, Definition of harm reduction is a set of practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with drug use. And, and this is a model that's uh, implemented um, nationally. It's um, limited because it's not part, considered part of mainstream health care. And up until 2016, most federal funding was prohibited for supporting this uh, based on fears that provide needle exchange can encourage drug use. Um, so. Also, because of the response to the, the Indiana outbreak, I think there has been a tide, you know, a, a, a culture shift that for most communities find this more acceptable, although still not all. Um, but we still have a ways to go to incorporate this in, as, a main, as a main strategy, and the amount of funding available for prevention service still lags quite far behind. Um, it is still a far cry from what we're calling patient-centered medical home. To review the key concepts of patient-centered medical home, it's definitely patient-centered. But because of funding limitations, the, the types of services provided in harm reduction centers, like needle exchange programs, is far from comprehensive. There aren't resources really to coordinate care, especially care that involves interaction with the formal health care system and the services that other people need, in addition to traditional harm reduction services, like addiction treatment, like immunizations, and even primary care, are not always accessible to the clients who, who tend to use needle exchange programs. So what's clearly needed, and this is really the motivating, this slide is the, 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 the motivating concept behind the study that I'll be talking about, is that we need a new model of care, a new model of service coordination. Needle exchange programs and, and similar harm reduction services are in many ways mile ahead, miles ahead of the healthcare service because they have um, engaged with the population that does not utilize care. They provide it in a non-stigmatizing way and they've, in, in they've developed the trust of uh, communities of people who inject drugs over many years. But there's a lot more that can be done. And what we're proposing is that we can build out services in prevention services using the needle exchange program model as a, as a backbone, but then using the model of, of the patient-centered medical home, build something that we can really call the, the client-centered prevention home. We're not trying to replace or supplant primary health care but we acknowledge that there's many needs that are going unmet by this population, and can we build out this harm reduction or prevention services model in a way that helps facilitate deliver of the delivery of these important services? So the study was designed to do this, and in the next 10 minutes or so, I'll talk about how the study was designed and what our early findings are and where we're going from here. The grant mechanism for the Wisconsin branch of the Rural Opioid Initiative was a five-year study divided into two parts. The first phase, which was called the UG3 phase by the, by the, uh, the grant giving agency, uh, was from September 2017 to this should be August 2019, and we're finishing the, we're finishing the, the phase one later this, later this summer. The goals of this were to, were to 
estimate the seroprevalence of HIV and hepatitis C, to conduct a community needs assessment through stakeholder interviews, and to assess health behaviors and healthcare access using the client survey. We sought to enroll people who are existing clients of the needle exchange program in the six communities that I mentioned, as well as people in their social network. To be eligible, people had to be 15 years of older and injected drugs to get high in the past 30 days. It was not strictly limited to opioids. Any drug uh, used for, um, for the purpose of getting high was acceptable. Um, and we specifically targeted so-called non-urban non or rural. The, number, the communities in our study are not typically rural, as in they're sparsely populated, but they're definitely outside of the main uh, population center of Wisconsin, which is really in the southeast. And we know that the, service, that the clients used by these in, in these what are really medium-sized cities across Wisconsin are, tra are often traveling from long distances uh, to utilize services because they're not available in the, in the smaller communities. So on an individual level, clients who, who consented to participate would get rapid tests for HIV, hepatitis C, and syphilis. They would do a computer-based questionnaire lasting 25 to 30 minutes. And if the HIV, hepatitis C, or syphilis test was positive, they would need to get a blood draw for, to, for confirmation, which would be sent to a laboratory. We used a, a, a strategy called respondent-driven sampling, which is that it, when we had participants who were eligible, they would get coupons to enroll people in their, in their social network or, or other people that they knew who were also, who were also eligible for the study, and they received a small incentive to, to um, engage people in their social networks. There's also a qualitative study um, where we did more in-depth interviews to really try to get a more in-depth um, understanding of the barriers that people encounter when trying to use prevention services or addiction treatment. The second phase of the study, which starts later this fall, is implementation of what we're calling the client-centered prevention home model. Whereas all the data that I just described collecting, we're, we're in the process of synthesizing and thinking about what does that teach us when we develop um, a model to build, you know, or an intervention using, using prevention case managers rather than, than um, the medical case managers to try to improve prevention services. Here's an example of what the, some of the data that collecting that we look like. Um, the map of Wisconsin, again, shows the six counties, the darkly colored ones. Um, maybe I can use my, my pointer again. The, the dark, darker colored counties are where the prevention services offices are in, the, in these cities. And then the lighter shaded counties are um, where clients have come to these offices to use services. So this really is a very large service or study area that we're doing, even though um, data collection is centered in these offices. The, the, um, the two largest uh, offices are in La Crosse, the city of La Crosse and the city of Green Bay, which is in Brown County. And this shows an example of one of the referral chained or referral uh, networks that gets generated on a driven sampling. The very first participant that was that was enrolled actually was over here in the cross. We all we all remember the day we enrolled our first person. This, these individuals were people that that individual enrolled, and so on and so forth. And we've we've um, uh, able to track these social networks or these injecting drug use networks. And the data visualization here shows that in the same network of people who are all connected by certain several degrees of separation, there's, some, there's a fair amount of heterogeneity about which drugs that they, that they use most commonly. commonly. Here, b the blue boxes are people who said that they use heroin predominantly, where green is methamphetamine. And we can, also, we can also distinguish people in the network how many have had a reactive or a positive hepatitis C test versus non-reactive. So we're understanding the community on a, on a somewhat uh, granular level in understanding how, who in these networks are at risk and who might be at high risk for transmission of hepatitis C, for example. Other general findings, these, uh, we've, we've um, now enrolled over 800 people in, this, in the study. About 50% of them, we found this interesting, were not clients who, who used the needle exchange on a, um, on a regular basis, meaning they were people who were rather in the social networks of, the, of needle exchange clients. This was a de deliberate goal of the study to try to get people who might not be normal clients, who might not have relationships with the prevention staff at these places, um, to try to see if these individuals are at higher risk or have unmet needs. We've had a very, uh, thankfully, low number of reactive HIV tests. There were three total. Two of them were already known and plugged into care, so only one 
um, new HIV diagnosis out of over 800 uh, people enrolled so far, which is um, higher than the baseline prevalence of, from Wisconsin, but not by much. Um, there is a very large prevalence, a high prevalence of hepatitis C. So 34% overall of people have, have hepatitis C infection. About half of these, or perhaps slightly more than half, were unaware that they were infected prior to enrolling in the study. So this is one of our, 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 our sort of most important findings so far, is that um, despite Wisconsin having a relatively robust network of needle exchange programs, there is a large amount of hepatitis C transmission going on, and we're seeing this in these networks. Another thing that was unexpected, um, because this was, after all, referred to and titled the op Rural Opioid Initiative, because there's such an epidemic of opioid overdose, and that's really the uh, was the injection of uh, oxymorphone in Indiana that got everyone's attention in a well-known heroin epidemic. Um, what we're finding is that of people who are injecting drugs and are at high risk for complications, uh, slightly more than half. Now, as, as of our most recent findings say that actually methamphetamine is their so-called drug of choice or the, dr or the drug that they inject most frequently. We've also found that most people are, are, injecting, mul are injecting multiple drugs um, and go through periods where, where, they, where they inject stimulants and opioids and rel uh, one more than the other. An, import an important goal of the study is to try to understand how people perceive the accessibility of treatment and prevention services in the community. Our study is built around the idea that we might not be able to provide comprehensive health care for everyone, but there is a, a, a finite list of services that the World Health Organization and other, and other human rights organizations have said that ought to be available for every person who injects drugs as a means to prevent overdose and HIV. Um, and some of these are on, the, are on this list. For example, medication-assisted treatment with, with so, uh, buprenorphine or methadone or naltrexone, when we asked people whether this was easy for them to get or, or somewhat uh, or difficult to get, um, most people said that it was um, more difficult than easy. The bottom, the, the way that we um, listed the things here, the bottom were the things that with the, with the large dark red were the things that people had the, the least difficulty obtaining. So clean syringes or needles or condoms, people had relatively, were easy to access, but medication-assisted treatment, immunizations for hepatitis B, and um, were, the, were more difficult to get. And the other ones um, in terms of uh, treatment for sexually transmitted diseases and access to naloxone for overdose prevention were in the middle. I would say one of the most striking findings from our qualitative review qualitative interviews are um, both an, a relative indictment of our mainstream health healthcare communities, but also a real endorsement of the harm reduction model, and specifically the staff that are engaged in the, in the work. So I want to read these two, two quotes from some of the, the interviews, and I put them on the same slide just to juxtapose them. Um, we asked them, what's it like to receive healthcare in the area where you live? And the, what the respondent says was, when you go to doctors, they look down on you. It's the most ridiculous thing. It's, it's, it's embarrassing. It makes you feel worthless. Less than that, when you go to a doctor and say, the doctor asking, why are your veins so naughty? When you have to tell them that you're an IV drug user, it just destroys the relationship you have with certain doctors. If you tell them you're sick or you need this or that, the first thing they jump back to is, oh, well, you're just an IV drug user, and you're just going to come here looking for pills. This was um, a sentiment that was, was you know, not unique um, in the interviews that we, that we have, that people feel relatively stigmatized by, in, by re receiving routine health care. Um, by some contrast, when we ask what's it like to receive services here at the, at the syringe service program, they say it's wonderful. That they don't make me feel like I'm a um, piece of expletive drug user. It's kind of weird, to be honest with you. The ladies here and these guys are awesome. They, they make you feel like, what can I do for you? What do you need? Do you need anything else? Can I help you with anything? Do you want to get educated? Now, that's awesome. You know. So this reinforced our suspicion or our, our hypothesis that ser you know, service organizations or um, community group organizations that are engaged in harm reduction is a very important place to start because it's a place where we can start that might start to undo some of some of these years of um, sort of toxic stigma, stigmatization, and criminalization that has really pushed people who inject drugs away from routine healthcare situations. Um, 
the stigma and marginalization come up over and over again when we talk to people about what, what is it like to them, what keeps them from using services. Here's here are two, two additional quotes. Um, first was, I was supposed to bring five people to participate in the study, but nobody would come. They're scared to come here because they feel like they're going to get arrested because of being a user. You know, we shouldn't have to feel scared. I know it's illegal to do drugs, but wouldn't they rather us be doing them in a safe way than bringing dying and getting diseases and infections? And a, a really impressive quote, I think this was a different person on, on the bottom, said, you know, I've, I've been in a situation talking about why, why people don't call 911 after they use naloxone. And only once did they call 911. But I always tell them if I overdose and I don't come back, just drop my body in the alley, but don't say anything. If anything, call my mom or sister up. I, just, I don't want the stigma attached to me that they got a junkie overdosing in their house. So this was more, more than expected stigma and, and marginalization. It was a, was a challenge that, that's encountered. Um, and as a, speaking as a, as a physician and someone who provides health care, I, I think we need to, to own this and, and look at ourselves and say, how can, we, how can we do better to make people who have these extraordinary needs feel more welcome in, in health care situations? And um, another piece of our study, this was a sort of, we got supplemental funding to, to, to look specifically at the provider angle of this issue. Um, and we, um, I'm going to present some of those, some of those findings next. We, we did what we call the Wisconsin Primary Care Provider Survey, and it was a, a sub-study of this rural opioid study. And the goals were to, to a, a couple goals. The, we, we wanted to try to identify how many people were currently um, had their, as their job description, primary care providers, meaning not, not addiction medicine specialists, but primary care providers, specifically family medicine providers, who had adopted medication-assisted treatment as part of their practice. And, and what's special about them? How is it, how is it going? And, and what can we learn, if anything, about how, how to motivate other, primary, other people in the primary care work, workforce to, to help take this on? Um, we wanted to look at rural and urban differences um, in providers to see um, whether the rural primary care workforce might have a, a, a bigger role to play because of the relative um, the, the relative absence of specific addiction treatment in rural in rural communities, um, and we had a hypothesis. We just wanted to explore, building on some of these testimonials that we heard from our patients, is you know, did do providers do they feel like they're they have stigmatizing or negative attitudes, and is that a barrier to primary care in rural rural communities. So before I get into that, there's one, you know, one more, this is sort of the last literature review slide I wanted to, but, it's, but I think it's very important. So um, the reason that I think it's important to engage primary care workforce in addiction or particularly opioid treatment is that this problem has gotten far too big for, the, for specialists and you know, addiction medicine specialists or methadone clinics to take on. Um, and we have really effective tools. So this, this study was from, uh, all, from an all-payers claims database in Massachusetts. And, it, and it, wanted to, it looked at people who had a non-fatal overdose, who came into the hospital or some clinical setting and, and had, or like an emergency department, and had a non-fatal overdose. Um, what were the risk factors for having a subsequent fatal overdose? And they looked at, how, at who was prescribed medication. And, um, and they looked at whether people received methadone, buprenorphine, naltrexone, or no medication uh, with MOU, medication for opioid use disorder, and they found a you know a, a pretty a, a pretty robust uh, treatment response. So of all the people who had a non-fatal overdose, within one year, five percent had a fatal overdose and had died, um, and that was uh, people who were linked to methadone after having an overdose. Um, it was two percent, and it was even it was lowest was down to one percent of people who used naltrexone. So this is strong data that linking people to treatment, and I, I, I intentionally use the word linkage to care because that's something that we've talked about in HIV for decades now, is that when someone has an HIV test, that is the moment where we need to link them to care, and the sooner the better. And so if you link people after non-fatal overdose to, to MAT, medication-assisted treatment, um, it, there's a mortality benefit. So that's the good news. The, the bad news is in the second slide from the same paper showing just how few people were linked to care in the year after they had a non-fatal overdose, um, despite there being a really potent mortality benefit from these drugs. Only 10 to 15 percent received any MAT during the 12 months following a non-fatal overdose. So there are numerous reasons for why this, with, why this are. But again, this is learning from 
HIV, where we, we use as a quality measure in, on the, on, in public health settings and in our health systems, you know, how many days does it take for some, from the time to a, um, someone having a positive HIV test to getting on treatment? Um, and if it's less than 90%, we feel like we're failing. So having that high of a standard to get people on evidence-based treatment is, is um, a strategy that I think we need to pursue. And this is just an example of how far away we are from having that same kind of, strat same kind of success. All right, so back to, this, back to the provider survey. We used a uh, mail-based survey. People got a $5 incentive whether they returned it or not. Uh, we sent it out to 1,500 providers, and we sampled family medicine providers um, across Wisconsin. Um, and we over, slightly oversampled people in rural, sample, in rural counties and slightly undersampled in urban counties. And we also tried to send us a, quest, a questionnaire to every single person that we knew from the SAMHSA database had been waived had received the waiver to prescribe office-based opioid treatment with buprenorphine. And we did this uh, last, uh, last summer. So we got a good response, over six, 600 people and from all over the state. And um, after three, three mailings, we got a 45% response rate, which is not bad for, for physicians. Speaking as a physician who gets a lot of surveys, and ha I have personally have a less than 45% response rate. So I felt OK about this. So what we found, so seven, only of, of the 600, only 78 had received the waiver to prescribe office-based treatment with opioid use disorder. And again, this isn't the, this isn't the, per, the per, percentage. We, we tried to sample everybody. So this is, as best we could tell, um, you know, far less than 1% of family medicine providers have, uh, I'm sorry, not, not less than 1%, about 5% had a waiver in our, in our sample. Um, but concerningly of those, the, you know, the largest, uh, the plurality of uh, weight, primary care providers that had a waiver said they weren't using it at all. Um, and another 26% had prescribed it between 1 and 10 patients. There was only a few, there was less than 20% that had over, fi over 50 patients in um, who they were prescribing uh, office-based opioid treatment for. And when we asked them, you know, why not or what, what gets in the way, these are providers who are clearly motivated to treat opioid use disorder in, among their patients because they, they had to go through the training and get the waiver. And we asked them, why aren't you doing it more? Um, the three big ones were um, time constraints. You know, it's, it's, it's time in primary care settings. We don't have a lot of time. It, you know, it, there's, it's, it's not necessarily uh, easy. Um, the other thing, which the biggest one, was that um, I think, in my opinion, a correct assessment that this works better if there's also addiction counseling and other mental health services available. And most, most of the providers in our uh, provider survey said that they would, be, they would be doing it more if they had better mental health services to use, use them. Um, and when we asked them about uh, to self-report some of the attitudes that they have uh, for what it's worth, um, you know, people shared that they, did, they do have some, some negative beliefs. In fact, we asked them that when we asked them and here on, on the bottom, just despite my professional beliefs, I have negative reactions toward people who have opioid use. Um, you know, and a third of people said, yeah, yes, I do. Um, there's uh, other kind of stigmatizing beliefs or that, you know, people with opioid use disorders overuse health system resources. More, ha more than half people said that. Um, so it's, you know, there's a, there's a wide range of how people responded to this, but, but I think we found that there's, you know, they're prevalent. It's not rare for people to have somewhat negative uh, opinions about having people in, you know, providing treatment to people with substance use disorder in the primary care settings. This is part of the most, the most disappointing um, finding from um, the, the standpoint that we need to have more of an all-hands-on-deck approach. Um, is that whether both rural and urban providers um, both said that they, the most common was that people are not at all likely to want to do this in the future. So it's, it's definitely a, a minority of primary care providers who are considering or, or, or doing this. At least that's, um, you know, as of last year among family medicine providers in Wisconsin, there's, this does not seem to be a high priority uh, in, in terms of adopting new, new practice. So what's next? So we've, we've, we've learned a lot about risky behaviors. We've learned that there is a, um, a growing and um, high level hepatitis C epidemic. And we learned that there's a, a, a nuanced and somewhat complicated set of barriers to engagement in care. So, so how, are we, how are we going to tailor this intervention next? So what, what we're planning to do in the next phase of the study is 
is um, develop an intervention that we're calling prevention navigation. You know, health system navigation, sometimes used by peers, known as peer navigation, is, is, has been really developed initially in cancer settings for, for people in, who get a diagnosis and are facing a complicated health system and feel, can tend to feel overwhelmed, may have low health literacy, uh, may be underinsured and not have all the resources. And so we're taking that approach that with some um, uh, tailored, patient-centered, uh, ancillary support that exists not you know, outside of healthcare systems but helps people navigate systems that will, that will uh, be able to help reduce some of these barriers. Um, the goal of the CCPH, and we're calling it the Client-Centered Prevention Home, is to increase knowledge of people who inject drugs on navigating prevention and treatment services. We're focusing on HIV and hepatitis C as well as, as, well as overdose. The idea, the title, or the, the, the evolving job description of the prevention navigator will be to provide intensive care coordination, support services for HIV negative individuals who request assistance in accessing services to prevent infectious disease consequences. Um, our thought is that they will, they will work alongside the um, prevention specialists. So within ARCW, their Department of Prevention Services, the, 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 the professionals that essentially run the needle exchange are in the in the these community-based offices and and provide education and do rapid testing and do a, do a lot of you know, service coordination and give advice and are really seen as a resource, but the volume of needle exchange and other things you know, doesn't doesn't allow them to t t sort of to do higher level things like helping people get enrolled in insurance, for example. Um, so our idea is that we would have a prevention navigator that works alongside prevention specialists to really focus on a subset of people who could really benefit from or are really needed or who have a, a, a need in getting plugged in um, to help reduce the barriers on a really case-by-case -case basis. So the risk reduction counseling will be similar to what's going, what happens now in needle exchange pro programs. The care coordination um, or the prevention service coordination would be based more on a protocol, be slightly more client-centered in that people will have a chart. You know, in health in healthcare systems, everyone has a chart, or if not an electronic medical record, at least some record of, you know, what, when was the last time you had this, this test or this vaccine. Needle exchange programs don't operate that way, and I, I think for good reason, um, because we want it to be low, low threshold. Uh, we want people to feel welcome. We don't want to, you know, people, we, if people feel more comfortable using these services anonymously, that's important. Um, but to take the next step into, into more formal care coordination, um, it's, we're going to try to coordinate in a way that's more person-centered and, and has a little more investment in time by both clients and providers. So there's different models that we could, and we're exploring both. Um, ARCW is a healthcare organization and could potentially provide some of these services, um, such as immunization. Um, at least in the Green Bay office, which is where one of the intervention sites, they're, they're, they have they have nurses and providers, and could potentially co-locate treatment. Um, but I think more often than not, it will be identifying resources in the community and helping people navigate those navigate those systems after building skills and making sure that they're they have uh, insurance. Another important part of our work. Um, that has been a goal from the beginning and will become increasingly important as we start to start to, start to um, implement the study is partnerships with other agencies in the communities that are already engaged in the response to um, opioid and, and methamphetamine use disorder. So local public health agencies um, have been important partners from the beginning. They already do hepatitis C testing. They do testing in jails and other settings. Um, and they, they come across individuals in the community through their outreach and through testing um, who could benefit from care coordination in ways, some of whom might not be existing clients of ARCW. The counties that we've chosen to work, um, perhaps uniquely so, and I say this uh, based on um, sharing notes with, with collaborators in other areas of the country, these counties have uh, tend to have robust task forces. I think of La Crosse in particular has a, um, an alliance that involves all, t all uh, sectors of, of public service, including law enforcement and health and healthcare and public health, 
um, and faith-based organizations and recovery advocacy communities, they've done all this you know, well before the study was launched to, and have these task forces and, and um, multi-stakeholder groups. And I think that's been a really, really a facilitator of thinking about the best way to, to do this is to realize what are the resources that are already in place in communities and how, and how can the existence of a, of a, a new trained workforce um, that is based in the harm reduction model complement and perhaps uh, help people get connected to the existing resources that are there. Um, and uh, dealing with health systems. So we have a, a dire need uh, uh, for getting people linked to treatment for hepatitis C, which is, after all, curable. And it's the same goes for HIV, where if people have no detectable virus in their blood, they are not contagious. And, and if we could scale that up and get the majority of people with hepatitis C treated so they're not they not have the virus, then we're going to cut down transmission. But that requires a health systems approach, and we need to have make sure that you know, people who have um, addiction treatment coordinated with their infectious disease treatment um, and their primary care providers to make sure that that all folks are on the same page and that patients feel like they're being you know the ne their needs are being met. So these are these are big challenges, um, and I I think we've we've collected enough information, engaged the right people that we can develop strategies, um, even though we don't, we don't, might not have the answer. But I think we have, a, we have rich opportunities to work together on an ongoing basis to figure out what are, the, what are the best ways to get people connected to services. On an individual level, how we see the, the, the program working is that people who are, who are clients of the needle exchange program will probably prioritize people who have a positive hepatitis C test or are express motivation in getting linked to either treatment for hepatitis C or medication-assisted treatment. Um, there'll be an intake where they do an, an assessment and a needs assessment and a service plan development by, by the prevention navigator. The service plan will be implemented over, over a period of three to six months with a sort of a checklist approach to say, are these, are these the service goals that have we met them? And the, the, uh, the possibility of being a bit extended or intensified. Um, and then if, if and, and when the goals are met, people can be, can be discharged. The service plan will be modular in that, you know, there'll be, we're, over the summer, we're going to be developing um, sort of individual level uh, training modules that, that are based on motivational interviewing and um, sp uh, accessibility of specific needs, like how do you, how do you navigate the healthcare marketplace in these specific ca cases? Who is eligible for Medicaid and what, and what forms do they need? So there'll be a training plan for the prevention navigators to be able to do this. But when, this, when the protocol is developed, there'll be a, a manual um, which, you know, based on an individual's needs, um, we can do over the course of a, over a three-month intervention. Not everyone might express readiness for um, addiction treatment, but we will use a you know, motivational interviewing approach and or, or, or a readiness to change approach and see can we move people along that stage. Um, there are other things we we have some partnerships here at the at the UW um, who are really interested in community-based approaches to smoking cessation, which um, initially wasn't on our radar screen as a as a high priority for this population. Um, but we learned that somewhat, some, something like 92% of the individuals who are using services at ARCW for, need, for needle exchange services are current smokers, and many of them want to quit. So even though I think there's a, it's probably a bias toward you know, having bigger fish to fry and wanting people to get treatment for their opioid or methamphetamine use, um, we've learned also from HIV that when we control people's HIV, they're more likely uh, to die in the long run from cardiovascular disease, like everyone else's. So since we are engaging, we feel like we, we feel like we would be shirking some duty by not making evidence-based smoking cessation treatment for people if they're interested. In. So that'll be that'll be part of the part of the uh, intervention. And so we're right now we're we are in year three of the of the the study. Um, we're pr we're proposing our our uh, transition from the intervention from the I'm sorry from the planning phase to the intervention phase. Over the re the remainder of 2019, we'll be developing all the content for the patient the, the patient or the prevention navigation intervention with input from our community partners. We'll be pilot testing these. In the fall, we'll be hiring we'll be hiring and training prevention navigators to work at ARCW, and then hopefully in early 2020, 
there will be a um, you know a new a new staff member at the at these offices, and we'll start you know collecting um, you know, enrolling individuals and collecting data about both the processes and the outcomes. Um, we've got nowhere to go but up. When we looked at when we looked at the the linkage to care out, outcomes related to hepatitis C in our first study, we've We've um, we found only only one out of about 200 people who we diagnose who we diagnose with hepatitis C seem to have been linked to treatment. Um, that's just unacceptable, and I, um, there's a, there's a many barriers other other than um, you know uh, difficult to navigate health system uh, for this, and so it's, it's we're not going to fix the problem all at all at once. But we clearly have. Um, uh, Opportunities to to move the needle in a in a very substantial way in getting people linked to services uh, that they're, that they're currently not using. So another thing, and this is I think an important plug. Um, again, I, the ATTC uh, network I think is is largely based on people who are already engaged in addiction treatment and services in some capacity. So this might be better better tailored toward our colleagues who are in primary care who are not, but but. Um, one of our collaborators, Dr. Randy Brown, who I think has provided pr previous webinars for this group, um, is is leading a project Echo here in Wisconsin, which is a, a national a national institute to provide um, telephone or webinar-based support for um, providers who are trying to um, deal with difficult cases and get additional training. And they've um, recently rebranded this as the uh, as the accept or the addiction and comorbid conditions enhancing prevention and therapeutics, so they're, they're, uh, the target population for this is any provider who wants to take on uh, wants support in addressing addiction and its comorbid conditions, which I hope in the coming years will increasingly focus on hepatitis C and other infectious diseases because there's such a need. And uh, the, the web link here is something that you or your colleagues might be interested in um, for the. The webinar in the future. So, in in summary, we have a, a strong evidence-based toolkit to treat opioid use disorder and manage its consequences. Um, but these are dramatically underutilized by, by by many in our communities and particularly in our rural communities. There's an urgent need to implement these tools more effectively and equitably. And uh, my my thesis, or what I tried to convince you of in the past 50 minutes or so, is that there's a lot we've learned. From from the HIV/AIDS epidemic on how to take part patients who are marginalized and have a lot of unique vulnerabilities and help get them connected to services and and this works best when it's when it's patient centered, uh, free of stigma and coordinated and um, our our hope is that the model that we're developing with with input from really a lot of committed people in the communities will help us um, you know, make progress in this regard in this regard in the in the coming year. So. This isn't. Uh, this is. A, we're limited to the ability to having a discussion. Uh, it's, I guess it'll be more of a Q&A because I'm the only one who actually gets to talk. But if anyone would like to share reactions or post questions in the chat function, we can spend um, you know an additional 10 minutes or however long we want um, getting clarifications or sharing experience. So I'll stop there and open it up for, uh, to the group. Thanks so much, Dr. Westergaard. We do have some questions that have come in while you were speaking. And I'll start with the first one. The present presentation discusses the prevention navigator that will be used in the implementation phase. I'd like to learn more about this, how this person is trained and opportunities to promote. Do you have more information? Yes. Well, I'll tell you. So it doesn't exist yet, um, and, but I'll tell you our our approach, our our strategy. So one of the, you know, I think well, again one of the the strengths that we have here in in uh, uh, in our partnership in Wisconsin that involves the, the AIDS Resource Center of Wisconsin and the the State uh, Department of Health Services um, is that we've uh, we received uh, support from HRSA. Uh, Five, five or six years ago to develop what's a, a what I would call a pretty analogous type of intervention for people who are, are marginally engaged in HIV care. It was called the systems linkages and uh, systems linkages to care. I'm going to I'm going to mix up the what it, exactly it was called, but it was um, 
a special projects of national significance funded under the under the HIV program to develop um, this sort of one-on-one -on -one intensive patient-centered support to make sure that either people are linked to HIV care promptly after diagnosis or uh, receive additional support to to mitigate the risk that they will become disengaged if they're considered to be high risk. So we're using a protocol that was that was built for uh, this linkage, this HIV linkage to care, or intensive case management, or patient navigation. We've, we've referred to it by all, all of these somewhat interchangeable terms, but we're, we're using that experience as sort of a starting point. Um, and in terms to, to think about things about what uh, what type of background do, do people need to to work well? You know, the questions, for example, does someone with training in, in you know, someone with a master's in social work compared to someone who has lived experience. And, and we found that both models work. And I think the, uh, the, the job description is going to be somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat vague about the ideal qualifications, but more about you know, experience in working with the population. And the training will be done by um, our, our staff, which is comprised of a fair number of, of social workers, community health workers, um, and clinicians who will develop it, you know, and train these individuals over the periods of four to six months before, before we go live. And the, the, the Age Resource Center of Wisconsin um, has this um, probably 20 medical case managers on staff, and we're hoping to engage them in some of the day-to-day -day, um, skills that are needed to support people. So, so this, we are kind of explicitly, like, like I alluded to through the, through, the, through the talk, really borrowing from what we've done for vulnerable, supporting vulnerable patients in, H, in HIV care. Um, but the specific training materials and, um, and intervention content is going to be developed over the next six months as we synthesize all, all the different types of data that we've collected um, in, the, in the last year and a half or so. Thanks. Any? Dr. Westergaard, there's another question related to that. Uh, where are the sites that will be implementing prevention navigators? The, the uh, limitations of the funding were that of the six sites that we um, started, we'd had to, we had to pick three for the intervention. And we're cheating a little bit, um, meaning that the, the ARCW has offices in Appleton and Green Bay, and they're close enough, and the services in these areas are overlapping enough that we're hoping that we can um, have one prevention navigator that sort of use, you know, works among, with clients in and around that Green Bay Fox Valley area. So that will likely be one. The other likely two um, will be in Marathon County, and which is in Wa the city of Wausau, and also La Crosse County. So the other, we, the two other sites that we are, we're engaging are uh, Douglas County, which is Superior, and Eau Claire County. We have not, certainly not, given up on the ability to do this. But we might need to find different funding to do, you know, to, to have the strategy going forward, and um, and and there may well be. Um, similarly, there's four other sites um, that. ARCW has infrastructure to do this, so so we're we're, um, we're we want to do this everywhere that we have prevention services, um, but we're having to roll it out in a way that's limited some, somewhat by funding availability and and really the the goal and this is the goal of all of the all of the projects funded under this national collaboration is that we we, we don't we don't want this to be a study that you know where we're doing a, a research study that we try something and then the funding goes and then it goes and then it, it stops we're we're really trying to build this toward sustainability and I think the goal um, is if we do something and we do it well and we and we evaluate it in a way that shows value that it's something that can get expanded everywhere, um, but those are those are our immediate next steps, um, and then our aspirations to to uh, um, to expand after that. Thank you. Uh, another question: Without risk stratified assessment that evaluates lifelong risk for developing SUD chronic illness versus only acute tools currently available, how do we extend prevention of SUD? prior to injection-related disease transmission? So this is a question about how do we, how do we 
focus on prevention of substance use yeah. disorder rather than, rather than kind of mitigating its harms like we're doing. So that's a big question and um, something that our that you know that the task forces and the in the stakeholder groups in our communities are really working on um, uh, with law enforcement and schools and all all of the things. How do we how do we identify people who are high risk and prevent substance use disorder and um, I'm I'm afraid our particular project that might be a little bit out of out of scope. We're happy to be part of the part of the solution and take lessons learned about this. But but I think the upstream social determinants of health and of of of, 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 of substance use disorder are are you know really things that need to get um, you know addressed on a wide societal level. I, I think our our project is really focused on putting out fires and and really preventing bad outcomes from people who are are currently injecting drugs and the extent to which we we can learn about what has made these individuals' lives so complicated and you know for example the you know tra traumas that people have have experienced and the stigma that people have faced and I think may have lessons for primary prevention. Um, but the tool, the strategies that we're talking about aren't really primary prevention. They're really, they're really prevention of consequences of people who are already quite, um, you know, quite high risk. Thanks. And our next question is, how do we get more waiver providers unless we give them assessment tools to build their comfort in who and how to differentially treat? There's not even any standard for how much or which MAT meds or, and for what minimum duration best fits with risk levels? Yeah, I, I, that sounds that sounds like a more of a comment than a question, and I think it's I think it's good. I think it's true. Um, you know, I, I think in some ways my analogy of linking linking people to care for HIV might 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 fall short a little bit because. You know, if someone has HIV, there is one there is one answer. They need to they need to be on antiretroviral therapy um, relatively soon and for the rest of their life, um, or we know what happens. And I think people with opioid use disorder are it's much more heterogeneous. Some people don't don't want it. You know, it's 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 uh, the the risk. You know, the the clinical efficacy and the um, the way that people res respond is is certainly less than the degree that we, that we we think of with treatment for these infectious diseases so so I, I I'll take I'll, I'll take that as a, as a as a point well made rather than a question to say that um, you know I, I don't personally you know I don't personally fault providers who are not engaged in this and I think I think we're coming at it from the standpoint of what what are, those are the questions and how do we you know what what are the what knowledge gaps need to be filled and what logistical or systems level barriers need to be ameliorated in order to allow more primary care providers to take this on but I certainly I think there certainly are good re good reasons and, and certainly justifiable reasons where it's not feasible for many or if not most primary care providers to be engaged in this um, but it's um, but you know, at the end of the day there there are you know evidence-based treatments that we can we can certainly strive to have wider implementation of thanks uh, and here's a, a related question uh, this participant says, this is excellent information. Barriers to treatment in rural areas beyond general stigma, distance to services, lack of services, there's also the non-forgiveness for past behaviors. Can this be affected through patient-centered support? I think that's a, a, you know, a, a, a fascinating question, but if I guess to, to when we've talked about so the lack of forgiveness for past behaviors, I I think when you first said that, I, I kind of put that in the category of of stigmatization, um, or just you know sort of judgment, um, and we've had a lot of debate about this. Like if we, if we've identified stigma and judgment and criminalization as as the problem, how does a you know it's not the it's not the patient's fault necessarily. How does a patient-centered intervention ad address those things? But um, and, and that might be right. Like we're we're not going to you know fix a lot of prevailing so culturally or socially held con con conceptions and fix stigma with this with this type of intervention. But but we might we might reduce some of the harms that that environment has on individuals. And um, as part of our our multi-site collaborative, we had a guest speaker from the 
um, from the, the New England site who works on individual level stigma reducing interventions. And I get, what, does that, what does that mean? So it, um, it was a patient level or an individual level intervention that, that didn't try to fix what other people, other people not forgiving them, but it sort of tr trained resilience or, my, or almost like a, it made, sort of made me think of how people who do mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for things like chronic depression or, or chronic pain, you know, saying just, just despite that you live in a, an environment that can be toxic and you have to endure these things doesn't, doesn't mean that you can't meet your goals and you can't, you, um, um, and you can't have a fulfilled life. So, so that's not solving the problem, but it's consistent with a harm reduction approach. I think to the extent that there are strategies to help people function and feel better about themselves and have a sense of self-worth, inside a society that is very has very stigmatizing it, it seems something worth doing and you may have noticed on I think of our on our, our my bulleted list of potential modules um, that's something that we'd like to, to think about um, is that a stand, can that or should that be a standard part of the services we provide people to say look um, you're you know you're worth it you deserve treatment um, you might not always be made to feel that way when you access treatment, but it's still important, and let's help. Let's come up with strategies to do that. So, I think it's a promising approach. I don't think we figured that out yet um, in the in our study or or, or any study, um, but I think there is a way. At least I'm, I'm hopeful that there is a way to address you know the toxic effects of stigma and criminalization with uh, short of fixing the structural level barriers or the, or the societal. It, but of course, we still need to try to do those other things as well. We need to change discriminatory policies, and we need to, um, you, know, you know, we we need to have uh, those discussions about about acceptance and for forgiveness and non-judgment. But so we're we're trying to address that to the extent we can. But thanks for bringing that point up. And and here's another question, also related. We have three providers newly wavered as MAT providers, and they're starting to get negative responses from our chemical dependency treatment partner organization. Do you have any tips on how to alleviate this stress between the traditional abstinence treatment model and the harm reduction model? I'm going to try to read that question again because it's, I want to make sure I understand the, the dynamic here. So there's there's addiction treatment providers who are have more who are more of a abstinence-based paradigm who are having um, sort of who are providing negative feedback to providers using medication-assisted treatment. That's yeah. That's what. I yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I I don't have specific advice on how to manage those interpersonal uh, conversations. I, I tend to approach things as a scientist and um, and say that. You know, opioid use disorder is a is a chronic health condition that has specific diagnostic criteria, and when you use those criteria, and you do a clinical trial with these tools, um, people stay in people stay in recovery longer, and they overdose less. Um, so why shouldn't we use them? So um, I th that that's sort of been my approach is to is to try to steer away from from ideology and more toward evidence-based medical practice and i i think the evidence is pretty strong that these are tools you know they're not they're not a magic bullet um and they're not and they're probably not as effective in you know by themselves as they are in a comprehensive comprehensive care model that it that includes you know uh, one-on-one -on -one counseling and psychosocial support and everything, but but um, I think there's there is some stigma or there's some antipathy toward medications because they're medications. That's not that that still that hasn't really gone away to the extent that if you look at it just through a lens of a evidence-based medical treatment, I would expect um, this is a common thing we've we've heard in our our partners. You know the other the the other collaboration uh, the other collaborators in other parts of the country. In Appalachia and New England, um, have 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 told us the same the same dynamic is going on. There's um, in fact, there's one county in K Kentucky that actually outlawed outlawed buprenorphine. They they said it's they they, had, they passed an ordinance that no one can prescribe buprenorphine in the in the community because they thought 
I, I actually don't know the precise justification, but but there's a, there's some widespread antipathy toward toward medical treatment for various reasons um, in the treatment and the non-treatment community. And um, I don't have the solution for that other than to kind of think about it in terms of a you know, evidence-based treatment model and 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 harken back to you know what what effect do we know that it has on outcomes if we study it rigorously. Thanks, Dr. Westergaard. Our next question is about the service plan. You mentioned the service plan lasting three to six months. Is this flexible? After obtaining insurance, it very likely could take a couple of months in rural areas just to get an initial appointment with a provider. Yeah. Um, I agree completely. And, and the, the way that we thought about it would be that um, there would be a sort of a three-month service plan where we say these are the things we want to try to accomplish within three months. And then there'd be an assessment at, uh, at six months, say, are we making progress? You know, have we, have we met all our goals? And can the client graduate? Then, you know, then, then it would be, then it would be stopped there. And if not, we could extend it. And I think, I, I think what we've learned from our HIV linkage to care program is that um, it often gets extended and appropriately so. The challenge would be that some people benefit from from this type of support are never going to stop needing it or stop benefiting from it, and that's a that's a, going to be a, a challenge because this isn't necessarily a, a a general case management to help someone with all of someone's needs. We want it to be somewhat focused um, on prevention needs related to injection drug use, and so that's that's a dynamic we have to work on. But our, our expectation is that it probably would be up to a year. Um, but this is that's a, a you nailed you know uh, a, a very specific issue that we've encountered on the HIV care side that you know if we try to have intensive time limited case management that helps a lot of folks um, but some if you stop doing that some people are not going to do well and we don't we don't know exactly how that's going to how that's going to play out um, you know because we're not it's it's in the prevention services side and not the care side where people are necessarily going to have an ongoing you know, doctor-patient relationship, for example, I don't think it's going to be, you know, longer than that. It's really going to be focused around around goals, and I think six to 12 months would probably be the longest. Thanks, Dr. Westergaard. Uh, we have another participant who just has a comment. Our major challenge is transportation and ACT counselors managing clients' well-being. So the... Um, yeah, so count, so transportation in more rem remote areas, I think, is going to be a limitation to this as, as well. Um, one aspect of the study that I, I haven't talked about um, is is the degree to which we might use some mobile health uh, technology. Um, I think we because the, the there's no shortage of of need in the in the medium-sized cities where the studies are. I think that's likely where most of the clients are going to come from. But we know that people are driving for a long distance to use needle exchange, for example, and uh, we wanted to make it available to, to pro provide some support, possibly remotely. So some of our other some of our other work uses a, a mobile health application called HS that um, provides uh, addiction treatment support, and we're exploring ways to use things like uh, you know remote uh, you know the chat function to talk with a, with a with the prevention navigator or even a group chat message to get to get support about in, in, in information. So we have we we have a tool that's being used in other studies um, that we we may uh, pilot test incorporating here that we can try to provide care coordination services for people who are over long, over long distances. And I think even even in even in the the, the cities where we're we're working, it's. I think that would be useful because transportation within a city is can, can be difficult, and the degree to how much this patient navigate or this prevention navigation intervention happens by by phone or by text is something that we're going to learn how we go. I, I think it's probably important to have at least one or two in-person, face-to-face meetings where you get to know someone and make a good, you know, a good personal connection. But my guess is a lot of the follow-up interactions are going to be be you know, remote through through text or through by or by phone or potentially through the mobile health application um, to the extent that we get that implemented. Thanks for mentioning the HS application. 
And uh, there's been a lot of conversation in the chat box about Project ECHO. So we've added that web link to the resource as a resource in the one of the pods next to the slides. Great. And also there's a link to the addiction hotline, or I believe it's called the warm line, that's available in Wisconsin. Do you want to mention a little bit about that, Dr. Westergaard? Um, um, I'm not directly involved with that, although I see that Bree, who's chatting, is, is. I think, you know, if she, if she shared her, I don't want to put you on the spot or sharing your email, but there is an accept echo email address. I think those I think those would be the, you know, the web resources and to, and reaching out to, to breed directly would be would be useful. So our in our family medicine department um, we have an addiction medicine training program. Uh, Dr. Dr. Brown is who I mentioned as the the PI of the project Echo also uh, helps coordinate this addiction medicine warm lines. We have a growing number of providers who can provide technical support um, around the around the state, and um, you know I, I think there's there's you know funding support for it and that's clearly a, clearly a need. So uh, um, I don't hesitate to you know ask for additional resources if if you're interested. Thanks so much. Uh, let's see if we have any other questions that have come in. I don't see any new questions, but we could give it a couple more minutes if you'd like. Alternatively, we can come back in a year when we can give you an update on how it's going, and um, I would be I'd be happy to to do that at some point down the down, down the road. We're we're learning lessons every day about the best way to to do, to work in in this in this area, and we're happy to share it to the extent that. Uh, the ATTC network of providers um, is is useful. So, so please let us you know send any feedback if this was helpful or unhelpful. Um, you know, follow, you can reach follow up uh, questions by email. I'm I'm happy to to respond. Um, if my email wasn't on the the registration of links, I'm happy to share that for this for this group. Um, and um, yeah, so we I'm happy to happy to wrap up there. Thanks so much, Dr. Westergaard, and we'll definitely take you up on that. And look at the calendar for setting up a follow-up webinar for 2020. Okay. Uh, or sooner. Okay. okay. Thank you, thank you All everyone. Right. Thank you so much. Um, so I paused the meeting audio. Um, thank you so much for the webinar today. It was great. Thank you. Thanks. Veronica?